Okay, thank you everybody for attending our uh, home hardening best practices in the wildfire zone with a focus on ventilation. I'm Kelly with Brangard Vents. I'm one of the founders of Brangard Vents along with my husband Brent who is a firefighter in um, Southern California. I'm now the global business manager for Brangard Vents uh, as we were acquired by Tenmat last year. And also with us is Roberto Cassini who is the GM for Ten Mat North America and the president of Brangard Vents. Today we'll be talking about flying embers and property losses. We will look at identifying problems in the areas of home ventilation. I have uh, images so that everyone can be aware of exactly where those problem areas are and what the vulnerable vents look like. I'm going to review recent changes to the building code and legislation that went into effect this year. And then um, we'll talk about a, a little bit about uh, technology in fire events and what kind of testing that they're required to go through. And then at the end, we'll open it up for any questions. You can also feel free to use the chat function, um, which will be monitored as well. As many of you are aware, um, there's a big problem with embers and we're noticing it a lot more because more homes are being built in the WUI zones and WUI is urban interface where homes and brush mix. Just to give you a baseline on numbers, currently in the US, there are 46 million homes and 70,000 communities currently in WUI zones. And you can see by the map on the right, uh, California and Texas have the most number of homes in the U.S. And every year, about 40 to 50 percent of all new construction is built in the WUI zone. And this area is growing by more than 2 million acres per year. So um, what happens is as these wildfires hit, it used to be that, you know, they would just be in a wildland area. But now, as more of that wildland area has become wooey area, those, those embers are being blown into these communities and entering the homes. And because of that, we're seeing a huge, huge jump in property losses. Uh, you can see this data starting from back in 1980. Uh, 2018, which, um, you know, 2018, 19, and even 20 have been huge losses uh, in wildfires in the U.S. And now we're up to 24 billion. 90% of all homes are being ignited by embers and not the flames themselves. Um, with embers, it's a burn and they're just getting blown through the air during a wildfire. They can blow as far as four miles and still be hot enough to ignite something when it lands. And this is causes what's known as that hopscotching effect that you often see where one home burns down, you know, and it may be the only home that burns down on the street and maybe the head of the fire was, you know, two or three miles away and, and everyone's scratching their head as to why that home burned down. These embers will blow until they find something to land on um, and they can smolder for hours. There's been instances where, um, you know, crews will come into a home and think that it's fine and they think that everything um, has been put out and then they'll come back hours later and that same home is on fire because there were some embers sitting in there smoldering. So what happens is kind of a trifecta. You've got winds plus embers plus openings in the home. And that is what is causing all of these damaged and destroyed homes. So, you know, we've been really good about thinking about siding, making sure it's class A roofing, making sure we have our brush clearance, but we cannot forget the openings in a home. And any opening in a home is vulnerable to embers. You have vents, garage doors. You know, sometimes people evacuate in a rush and they leave their garage doors open. Garage doors also have vents in them. Sometimes they have a gap at the bottom of them where embers can blow in. 
uh, windows. Uh, sometimes they're left open also. You have cracks under the eave as the home settles um, and then openings under roof tiles where embers can just fly in. And once they blow in, they can ignite anything that's flammable on the other side. With a window, it could be your curtains. With vents, it would be your insulation that's in your attic or the dry debris that's under your house and your foundation. Um, and the vents are especially vulnerable. It's no different than leaving your window open. And quarter inch mesh and even eighth inch finer mesh do very little to stop them. And we have some video that we'll show you later on that kind of speaks to this. So practically all homes have ventilation openings and it's to promote energy efficiency. So we need them. Uh, there's no getting away from them. And we need a, to find a balance between maintaining that energy efficiency, but still keeping out the flames, embers and radiant heat. And so this graph kind of shows you the different locations where you would find vents. You'll find them on the rooftop. They can be half round like this. They can be sometimes hidden called low profile roof vents where they're very hard to find. And sometimes they're along the ridge here. You also have gable vents that are on the side wall of the home right at the peak. And then every home or most homes have an overhang, which if you look up under your overhang, you'll find rectangular events and you'll find little round, um, we call them bird block holes, sometimes two inches uh, in diameter. And some homes have hundreds of these. We retrofitted a home that had over 500 of them. I mean, imagine 500 openings on your home as a wildfire approaches and embers are being blown right towards you. So it's, it can be very important with those little round holes. And then here is your foundation vent where uh, sometimes those are hard to see because you've got bushes blocking them. And then garages and utility rooms are also one not to forget, especially if uh, flammable items are being stored in there. What I wanted to go over now was just kind of show you a few pictures of examples of traditional and unsafe vulnerable vents. So as you look around your property, We'll start at the overhang of the home. You've got sometimes these are these little round um, block hole vents. And like I said, they're two inches in diameter, three inches in diameter. And you can have anywhere from 30 to 500 of these going around your home. Um, sometimes you have strip soffit vents. And this is this long area here. Usually it's two or three inches wide and it's a strip of mesh or perforated holes that runs around the perimeter of your home. Sometimes you'll see those same perforated holes running um, perpendicular to the home and they're either in vinyl, which in that case you'd wanna replace the entire vinyl soffit with something more um, fire rated or sometimes people will put fire rated soffiting material in like a fiber cement, but still have the perforated holes in them. So those perforated holes are not fire safe and flame and embers will still blow up through there. And then the last picture on the right is your eave vent, which is usually just a fine mesh that's placed in between rafters. Uh, moving on to roof vents, you'll have some low profile vents like the picture on the left. Uh, this one you can see pretty decently, it sticks up three inches high. Sometimes they only stick up one inch from the roof. So you have to really kind of know what you're looking for. And we always help people with that as well. Turbine vents, which blow in the wind. So they often can actually pull embers in through them. And then you've got half round dormer vents. And then to the right is an example of a gable vents. And notice with the dormer and gable vent with the horizontal slats, you can see right through them. The only thing that's behind those, it's a straight shot for the embers to go in. The only thing behind there usually is quarter inch mesh or eighth inch mesh. Um, the foundation is often overlooked. Um, remember that things build up under the foundation, dry debris, leaves. Um, it's very easy to become a flammable hot spot if embers get in there. And so you've got sometimes just these mesh vents on the left. Sometimes they're architectural like the brick picture. Um, sometimes they have like a mini louver vent to it, and then you've got garage vents to the right. 
Other things to look for when you're walking around your home is gutters that have no gutter guards. As you can see here, um, leaves and debris accumulate very easily in your gutters and they get dried up and it's just the perfect hotbed for embers to accumulate and then start a fire going up your roof line. Um, open roof edges, um, you can see on the left of this tiled vent, they've been mudded in, uh, which is very good to do. And then to the right, they have not been mudded in. So to the right, the embers will just blow up under there and potentially ignite any kind of underlayment that you may have up under there. Um, and then combustibles against the home, like wood stacks, uh, definitely wanna pull those away from the home. And then to the right, you can see the burr block hole vents, but look at the cracks that have formed between that wood. Um, and what you can do is just take a fine um, tip, you know, clear caulking and just run it along there to seal those up. So who says traditional vents are dangerous? Um, everybody is starting to say it. Um, they've been a topic since back in the early 2000s, even the late 90s. Um, but now with as bad as the home losses have been in recent years, it's really uh, being addressed in many different ways. You have governmental agencies that are recommending solutions for vents using fire rated uh, flame and ember resistant vents. You have state and local officials that are um, enacting stricter codes to use flame and ember resistant vents. Uh, and then you've got the IBHS Research Center, which is the Institute for Business and Home Safety, and they're funded by the insurance companies. And so they've been doing a lot of testing on embers and how it affects the home and which parts of the home are vulnerable and then making recommendations based on that. And I'm gonna share with you a video um, that shows, bear with me, that shows uh, it's much longer so you can find this on their website. There we go. Tell me when you can see this video. Yeah. Should be coming up any second. Sometimes there's a slight delay. No? no. Hmm. I wonder if I hit play. Kelly, I see it. You see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you see it yet? Okay. Dennis, are you able to see it? Finally, just came up. Okay, perfect. I'll go ahead and hit play. So what you're watching, it starts with some sighting burning, and then you'll see they'll flash uh, on the screen a little message about the vents, the vent portion of the video. So it talks about how the vent that they're testing has eighth inch mesh, and that even with eighth inch mesh, that the hot embers are still able to blow through. So I'll show you. You'll see that pop up here in a second. Here it is. This is an eighth inch mesh screen. So they are realizing now that even though eighth inch mesh is better than quarter inch mesh, it is not a solution to keep flame and embers out during a wildfire. Are you able to see the PowerPoint again? You know, it's still on the video. It's, it's got the, uh, it says the fiberglass window screen allows. So it still has some notes from the movie. Okay. 
There we go. Back. Seems like there's a 30 second. Yeah, there's a delay. We're back now. <laughs> okay. So, you know, what what is this um, change from, you know, recommending mesh or finer mesh to now fire vents? Um, you know, fire vents have been on the market since 2007. They have they've been required in the soffit of the home. Uh, but now it, it's starting to expand even beyond that. So what differentiates a fire vent from just putting up some finer mesh? Well, there's three main things. And in order to you know, be considered a fire vent, you have to meet all three parameters above um, it, it, from a third party test lab that's certified by the state. So the first thing is embers. How is your vent gonna stop embers? Um, in our case, it's a baffled design shaped like a maze. Um, it lets air flow through, but then the embers get caught up in the baffles. They're forced to change directions multiple times, banging against the maze and losing momentum and heat as they travel through. It also has a metal component to it. So that's one of the things as the embers are banging against the vent, uh, it just robs it of the heat as it hits. And then the third layer of protection for embers is fine mesh on the back side of the screen. You have to have mesh anyways on the back side for um, bug control. And so um, you that mesh acts as a third layer of protection as the embers go through. It's really a, a last resort. Um, the next thing that fire vents have to stop are flames. With mesh, the flame will just go straight through. It does zero to stop any kind of a flame from going through. So with our vent, you've got two ways to stop the flames. You've got the overlapping baffles and it basically helps disperse the flames from going through. The next thing you have is if you encounter the most extreme of fire fronts coming to your home, we have intumescent strips that are tucked inside the baffles that should you get to that extreme fire scenario, they will activate and seal off the baffles. And then um, how do you stop the heat? Well, that's similar, the same technology as what we mentioned for flames. You've got these thermal activated seals that will expand and um, prevent any kind of heat that could self ignite wood because at 350 to 400 degrees Celsius, wood can self ignite. And so one of the requirements for a fire vent is that you're also stopping the heat. Again, mesh cannot stop this heat. So here's some examples of homes that have been retrofitted with um, fireproof vents. Um, you've got foundation vents, gable vents, uh, soffit vents, here's even some garage vents. As you can see, there's no damage done to the home to install these. It's like a, um, a retrofit window. You just basically cut out the inside and um, you know, push the fire rated vents into place. Um, ours can be painted. They can be made in copper, stainless steel, so they uh, look really cool on the home. And they can also be installed from the inside. So if somebody has a certain aesthetic that they don't wanna change on the outside, uh, as long as we can reach them from inside the attic, they can oftentimes be installed from behind as well. And as you can see here too, we do a lot of custom vents. I mean, here's octagons, we do triangles, circles, huge ones, little ones, access doors that you can open and close. Uh, typically, to retrofit a home, when you're looking at product and installation, it's about $1.50 per square foot. And there's always um, exceptions to that. We've seen big homes that have only a few vents, and we've seen small homes that have a ton of vents. Um, and copper, you know, could make the cost be more extreme as well. Here's some examples of what the retrofitting process looks like. On the left, you've got a soffit vent where it's just mesh. So step one is just to measure what that opening is, where that mesh is. Um, and then we make the vent and then the installer can come out and um, paint it and push it into place where the existing opening was. Same thing with foundation vents, <clears throat> measure the vent, cut out the existing vent, 
not doing any damage to the stucco or wall around it and pushing our vent into place where the existing vent was. Um, dormer vents up on the roof, they can be retrofitted from outside the roof or from underneath. And then here's your gable ends where you would just cut out these slats right here, these horizontal slats. You're left with an opening and then our vent basically fills that opening. And you can have them painted any color you want. In this case, they like the white trim and in the dormer vent, you know, it's painted to match the roof. So it's, you know, whatever color the homeowner designates. So I mentioned the eighth inch mesh is starting to go away. There's been a lot of after action reports, uh, national testing to show that the mesh is just not um, cutting it as far as making homes safer. So starting July 1st of this year, chapter 7A with regards to new construction is changing. It used to say you could use eighth inch mesh on the roof, the siding, the foundation, and only have to use fire vents in the soffit. But now the new code says all vents, regardless of where they are on the home, all vents must pass ASTM E2886 for flames, embers, and radiant heat. So for the ember portion of ASTM E2886, um, they put a piece of cotton on the other side and blow a bunch of embers down through your vent, and that piece of cotton cannot catch fire. With flames, the flames cannot penetrate the vent, and with heat, the temperatures on the backside of the vent cannot exceed 350 degrees Celsius. So traditional vents, eighth inch mesh, 16th mesh, um, louvered vents, they cannot pass the, these three portions of ASTM E2886. And so they will not, no longer be allowed in new construction in California after January 1st, or I'm sorry, July 1st. So that's the code update for new construction. So what do we do about all the existing homes in California? How do we bring those up to code? How do we continue to help make those safer? Well, AB 38 is um, a law that went into effect in December, well, it was signed in December of 2019 and went into effect in January of this year. And what it is, is a series of home hardening measures including the use of ember resistant and flame resistant vents. So it's a new disclosure form that sellers have to provide to the buyers. And it does two things. It says one, yes, my home is in a high fire area or no, it's not. If you, if you say yes, it is, then you have to go on to section two of the form. And that section has a checklist of items that you have to check to tell the buyer that your home is vulnerable. For example, my, my vents are, you know, vulnerable uh, mesh. My roof is not class A fire rated. My, my brush is not cleared. Um, my windows are single pane, not dual pane. So in that disclosure form, the seller is now liable to share with the buyer what is vulnerable on their home. And at that point, the buyer can decide, you know, how they want to proceed. At one point, it will be uh, mandated that anything that's vulnerable be fixed before the home sells. Um, we're also seeing insurance companies providing discounts or just flat out mandating that people swap out their vents in order to maintain their policies. So what can you do to promote change? Um, you can educate homeowners on wildfire protection best practices and try to put a big emphasis on vents Vents are not typically the fun, um, fancy item to deal with. You know, it's exciting to get a new roof or a new siding or new windows, but vents are often not uh, noticeable. So they're put on the back burner, which they should be one of the very first things that you do. And then um, also, if you're able to provide dedicated wildfire risk assessments, um, then it brings awareness to the homeowner where they stand. And from there, they can make a plan to, you know, start correcting the things on their home that need to be corrected. So some proactive marketing ideas that we suggest is you can do blast offering free estimates from BrandGuard. We do have installers that can come out and do that at no cost. You can make it a community day 
where you organize the community and we send um, our people out and they do um, you know estimates on multiple homes in the community. Um, we can create an informational video together about the events and any other ideas you guys have, we would love to hear. But that is it. I will open it up to any questions at this point. <laughs>